Hi guys, third time is the charm. Um, welcome back to our video. So we were just having some technical issues. Um, it seems that uh, our presenter today was just having some problems with her earbuds, um, which seemed like such a simple thing, but can make or break the video because it there's this awful echo as you guys heard earlier um, when uh, you don't have earphones. I learned the hard way after a couple of videos. So I'm just waiting for Dr. Um, Dankovich to start. Hi there. Um, okay. I see we have some viewers, so welcome back. I, um, I'm just waiting for Dr. Dankovich to join the video and uh, we can get started hopefully. How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah. Hi, Annalise. I haven't talked to you or seen you in a while. Hope you're well. And, uh, oh, okay. Oh, um, okay. Sorry. Hey, Katija. <laughs> oh, there she is. Okay. Oh, goodness. All right, so it just says it's adding her right now. Um, sorry for all the trouble. Hi. Hello? Oh, no. Okay, so we cannot hear. Can't hear you. For some reason oh. when it goes. Oh, now I can hear you. And now I can hear you. Oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> that was uh, really strange. Okay. Well, thank I'm very you sorry. for joining us. No, that's okay. And um, all right, guys. So I think we are on our way to getting this video done. So thank you so much for joining us um, and for all the effort and trouble. Um, so I wanted to introduce Dr. Dankovich. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Absolutely. It's perfect. Oh, okay, great. Um, and tonight we are, um, she's going to go over an article on antidepressant induced yeah. sexual dysfunction, which um, I work at the VA. So this is like the story of my life and <laughs> I'm excited to hear about it. It's uh, good to get a refresher on that topic. Um, okay, so let me read to you guys Dr. Dankovich's bio. Sh Dr. Dankovich, uh, MD, is a board certified psychiatrist and a fellow of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. She received her medical degree from George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, where she received the merit-based Weiner Award in psychiatry, in addition to several other honors and awards. She continued her training at George Washington to complete her residency in psychiatry there. She recently completed a graduate program for health professionals in nutrition science from the prestigious Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. She's licensed to practice medicine in Maryland and the District of Columbia. In addition to her private practice where she provides both psychotherapy and medication management, Dr. Dankovich is a faculty member serving as a clinical instructor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, where she supervises and teaches both residents and medical students. Um, one of her proudest endeavors is fundraising annually for the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. She finds her work in the field of psychiatry to be greatly rewarding, affording her the honor and privilege to hear and acknowledge the stories of patients. Um, and she finds Psychiatry Network a useful resource for peer support, especially in the setting of a solo private practice office, which can be somewhat isolating at times. Um, well, that's a very um, impressive bio. And I wanted to add, Dr. Dankovich actually is one of our future attendees for our Women's Psychiatry Conference, which is coming up this September. Um, and it looks like, because you didn't come last year, right? No, I didn't make it last year. I'm very excited to make it this year, though. Yeah. And um, you do live kind of close to the location of the conference, but are there mm -hmm. any other reasons why you decided to come? Well, I like the fact that it's a women's conference. Um, I like the fact that um, it's geared a lot towards how we sort of uh, run our practice and take care of ourselves and uh, network. So I feel like I'm I'm fairly strong on the academic stuff. It's that other stuff that um, that I could use 
you know, more resources All for right. you. So. Yeah, it's actually great. Um, I, uh, I did secure one of our speakers this year is going to be, which for solo private practice might not necessarily be useful, but I think can be useful in all aspects of our lives, but um, is contract negotiation. Um, yeah, and it's going to be an attorney that. who's doing that talk, who this is her area of expertise. And um, this would be if you're um, securing a new contract or want to update your um, current contract, uh, which I'm really excited about. So those are the types of topics that we have. So That's thanks for exciting. joining us. I'm excited to have um, both returning attendees as well as new ones this year. So well, thanks um, for the right. lovely introduction. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you go ahead and get started? Um, my apologies for the technical difficulties, but we'll get started. I'm doing the article, Antidepressant-Induced Sexual Dysfunction in Men. This is a review article from 2013. The authors are Seagraves from Case Western and Baylon from Wayne State University. Um, there were no known financial disclosures that I could determine. The purpose of the article is to examine the relative incidence of treatment emergent sexual dysfunction in men treated with antidepressants. So this is something I see all the time in my practice. And they concluded from the article that the incidence of sexual dysfunction in men is lower in antidepressants with a primary mechanism of action involving adrenergic or dopaminergic systems versus serotonergic. But we'll get into sort of the details of that. So starting with the intro section, um, they start off by saying, you know, it's difficult to determine whether sexual function is a comorbidity of depressive disorders. So especially libido um, is, is uh, a typical presentation of depression. And in that case, we would expect to see that sexual dysfunction improve with treatment versus um, sexual dysfunction being induced by our treatments themselves. And in this case, we especially see a lot of delayed ejaculation in men. Um, therefore, a complaint of sexual dysfunction could indicate a non-response to treatment or a side effect of our treatment. So um, it's important to identify because sexual side effects can often lead to non-compliance. I think it's really interesting that prior to SSRIs, there were so many much more concerning side effects with our older um, antidepressants, sedation, dizziness, weight gain, hypotension, anticholinergic effects, risk of cardiac arrhythmias, severe and life-threatening hypertension, um, the most clinicians, you know, didn't even bother to look for sexual side effects. It was not that important in the grand scheme of things. But when SSRIs became available, clinicians started becoming aware of their potential association with sexual side effects um, because they were no longer dealing with those other side effect burdens. Um, so finally, in this section, they state that recognition of medication-induced sexual dysfunction is important clinically for a few reasons. One is noncompliance. Um, if a side effect occurs, such as sexual dysfunction, and it doesn't resolve, um, it could be a deal breaker for that medication for a patient. Um, a second reason would be a further decrease in self-esteem, which is already often present in depressive disorders. And then thirdly, it might place additional stress on intimate relationships, which are probably already just, you know, um, in, in having some difficulties during depressive disorders anyway. The next section is methodology. So um, initially antidepressants were thought to have very few sexual side effects. Um, reports at that time were mainly um, based on self-reports, but even clinical trials at that time showed a low incidence of sexual side effects. And then clinicians started to be begin to report greater incidence of sexual side effects. And this was coming out in case reports and clinical series. So then Seagraves, um, who's the author of this paper, um, had a trial many years ago, but um, he basically looked at um, this phenomenon and found that some of the earlier trial results were actually faulty because of how they were, how were they, how they were trying to elicit sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So direct inquiry versus self-report um, makes a big difference. You, um, the incidence rates are much higher with direct inquiry. So there is no universally accepted methodology. Um, there's no universally accepted incidence figures um, for any of the antidepressant agents we use right now. So the incidence of sexual dysfunction can vary by whether you're doing direct inquiry versus self-report, and there's a fourfold difference. It could vary by the instrument used, and it could vary by the threshold established for the diagnosis. So currently, the accepted standard is direct inquiry, and you want to either ask an interview or um, use a questionnaire. 
Um, they then go on to describe the types of studies that we get our information about sexual dysfunction from. So um, unfortunately, most of the sort of gold standard in research, random, um, controlled, double-blind studies are funded by pharmaceutical companies. And in these cases, they're usually comparing their agent that they're marketing against another agent, and they try to pick something that has high side effects, um, high sexual side effects. Mm -hmm. um, there are some cross-sectional studies that are looking at multiple agents. However, they don't have a control. There's no randomization. There's no baseline examination of sexual function. But the very large sample size that they have does allow for some comparison. Um, but basically, they say, you know, we should use caution in the interpretation of any of these studies. And you really want to look at who's funding the study um, that you're looking at. Um, another thing that they cited was that a lot of our, our research doesn't look at the dose of the agent at which sexual side effects occur, yet there seems to be a dose response. So this is an area of need right now. Um, regarding the definition and recognition of antidepressant-induced sexual dysfunction, there are two major diagnostic systems that recognize this, um, the DSM-5 and ICD-10. So if you have the paper in front of you and you want to look at table one, it's actually the only table in the whole paper, um, this is the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for substance or medication-induced sexual dysfunction. So it looks at intoxication withdrawal or exposure to a medication. Um, it states that the involved medication should be capable of producing the symptoms, which I see some problems in that already. Um, there should be no other cause for sexual dysfunction, so no onset of sexual dysfunction prior to use of the medication, um, and no history of prior non-medication related episodes of sexual dysfunction. And then there's a specifier. You would specify with onset after medication use. And there's also a specifier for severity based on the percentage of occasions of sexual activity affected. So mild would be 25 to 50%, moderate would be 50 to 75%, and severe would be 75% or more. Um, looking at the ICD-10, the diagnosis begins with a specific causal substance. I actually went through all the ICD-10 diagnoses to see if there was anything other than, I mean, the only one that there is is drug-induced erectile dysfunction. So nothing for women whatsoever. And um, all the other ICD-10 diagnoses are related to psychoactive active substances actually. So there's nothing, you know, um, nothing else specific to antidepressants. Um, regarding recognition, it's difficult to determine whether sexual dysfunction is part of the symptomatic presentation of depression or medication induced. So sexual symptoms related to depressive orders typically um, include loss of interest in sex or decreased libido. This is the most common sexual difficulty with depression. It's actually an indicator of depression in most age groups, except for women over 70. Um, other sexual side effects related to depressive disorders include erectile dysfunction and difficulty reaching orgasm. Um, in this section, they start to talk about how important it is that we assess baseline sexual function prior to administering our medications. Um, so most patients are poor historians. We've got to ask, um, we've got to ask uh, not just, mm -hmm. you know, a broad question about sexual function, but um, you want to discriminate between the different aspects of sexual function. So is it an issue with libido? Is it an issue with um, reaching orgasm? What is the specific issue? And then track that as you're um, providing medication therapy. Um, the next part of the article starts to go through the different classes of medications. And they start with the older agents, so our tricyclics and our heterocyclics. So most of our information um, come from case reports and small clinical series for this. Um, so there are various sexual side effects, especially difficulty reaching orgasm. So up to 30% of patients on amipramine, up to 37% of patients on phenylzine. And then what's interesting is that more than 90% of patients on clomipramine um, will have difficulty reaching orgasm. And this is interesting because clomipramine is the tricyclic with the most marked serotonergic activity. Um, also, so by the way, it's currently on the list of medications that's um, in shortage for the FDA. I just saw that today. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, A lot of generic drugs right now, it seems mm -hmm. like, but it's one of them. Well, maybe sexual function will improve. 
Um, <laughs> but again, the earlier agents had such a multitude of other severe side effects that this wasn't really something they were, you know, looking at. They didn't appreciate um, the sexual side effects at the time. Um, moving on to our newer medications. So this is going to include our serotonergic antidepressants, bupropion, duloxetine, mirtazapine, nifazidone. I have never actually prescribed that, but you know, it's, it's out there, I guess, if you want to take the risk yeah. with hepatic issues, um, venlafaxine and velazidone. So we actually have a relatively large number of double blind placebo controlled randomized clinical trials, the gold standard in research. However, they're funded by pharmaceutical companies. And again, they're looking at the efficacy of their medication versus um, a competitor. So there are lots of studies out there that compare bupropion versus serotonergic drugs. And um, not to go through each of them individually, but basically they, are, they all show statistically significant differences. And the SSRIs have more sexual dysfunction than bupropion, nothing we didn't know there. Um, they looked at velazidone by pooling data from three randomized controlled trials of adults with MDD, and they compared velazidone versus placebo. And basically, they found no significant differences in sexual function except for decreased libido, which is kind of a big one, though. Um, and then there are a number of pharmaceutical-sponsored randomized controlled trials of sexual dysfunction with duloxetine, which is one of our SNRIs. Um, and the interesting thing about that is they would always compare duloxetine versus some type of SSRI versus placebo. And duloxetine would separate out in the acute phase of treatment, so the first eight weeks. But in one study, it was like 12 weeks onward, and the other, it was 26 weeks onward. But, but duloxetine, whatever the SSRI was, and placebo were all the same at, in, in the chronic phase of treatment. Mm -hmm. So there's no clear explanation why there's a difference between acute and chronic dosing, but there seems to be a difference, at least with that particular SNRI. Um, so that's it for that section. The, um, they then go on to talk about clinical series data. So there's actually a large number of uncontrolled clinical series that offer some evidence of the relative incidence of sexual dysfunction between various antidepressants. So this is like comparing one antidepressant to another to another and saying which, you know, kind of ranking them, which has more. So um, they're all, well, the first one is a prospective observational multi-center study done in Spain by Monteo and it was non-randomized, but what they found was that the SSRIs, including paroxetine, citalopram, fluoxetine, and fluvoxamine, and then the SNRI venlafaxine had more sexual dysfunction than either mirtazapine or nifazidone. And they noted again that the incidence of sexual dysfunction is much greater when, when they directly ask the question versus relying on um, self-report. And then they noted particularly um, that paroxetine had a much higher incidence of erectile dysfunction. Um, there, were some, there was a large multi-center cross-sectional observational study done by Clayton et al. in 2002. And they came up, they determined the odds of developing sexual dysfunction on various agents as compared to being on bupropion. So they give us an odds ratio for those. So for um, citalopram and venlafaxine, you had six times the odds versus bupropion. For paroxetine and sertraline, it was five times the odds. And then for fluoxetine, it was four times the odds. Um, and then finally, there was a meta-analysis of all the studies of antidepressant-induced antidepress sexual dysfunction in 2009 by Soretti and Chiesa. And they basically found that most of our SSRIs had the highest rates um, fluvoxamine, which is an SSRI that, you know, we don't use a whole lot, maybe OCD, and escitalopram, as well as duloxetine, and some of the older TCAs had lower rates, but still more than placebo. And then bupropion, mirtazapine, and nifazidone had rates similar to placebo. So that's it. That's all the data we have um, for the actual antidepressants. Um, there are then some studies that look at men who have premature ejaculation and what treating them with an SSRI would actually do to, to help the premature ejaculation because of the sexual dysfunction. So there's a series of double blind randomized fixed dose studies um, where they looked at the antidepressant effect on ejaculatory latency 
on men with premature ejaculation. And they used paroxetine, uh, 20 milligrams in one of the studies and found a nine-fold increase in latency time in two different studies. Um, mirtazapine at 30 milligrams had no effect. Citalopram at 20 milligrams had a two-fold increase, um, but that's a low, you know, a low treatment dose. And then paroxetine um, had had more um, led to more late, greater latency than sertraline, which led to more latency than nefazidone, which was equal to placebo. Um, they tried to talk about the mechanism at, um, of how antidepressants might be affecting sexual dysfunction, and we actually don't know a whole lot. So the exact mechanisms are unknown. They're likely multifactorial. What we know hasn't changed in basically 25 years. So um, we kind of know that erection in men is thought to involve dopamine and beta adrenergic stimulation. Um, inhibition of the alpha adrenergic system, and then release of a non-cholinergic vasodilator. And then we know that ejaculation in men is mediated by alpha adrenergic fibers and might be inhibited by serotonin neurotransmission. But everything else that they kind of figured out about even how our bodies function sexually um, actually are, sort of come retrospectively by by thinking about the side effects that our medications cause. So um, we know that 5-HT2 antagonists have a lower incidence of se sexual side effects, which would include our nefazidine and mirtazapine. So they say, oh, well, 5-HT2 activation is likely involved in sexual function. <laughs> um, and then we know that bupropion lacks serotonergic activity. So they say, oh, well, serotonin, serotonin reuptake inhibition is likely involved in ejaculation orgasm. So we really don't have a strong hold on this. Um, they also think that potentially SSRI-induced sexual dysfunction could be related to the P450 system and that CYP2D6 poor metabolism might be more at risk, um, but we don't have any hard data for that. And then they also started to look at the neural correlates of sexual dysfunction. Um, Clark et al. did this in 2012 using fMRI, so functional MRI. Um, I'm not going to go into all the results, but the one that was interesting was that paroxetine attenuates um, brain activation in the nucleus accumbens, which of course is our brain structure involved in pleasure. Um, so moving past that, we'll talk a little bit about the clinical management of medication-induced sexual dysfunction. So there are a variety of interventions. Um, you could wait for spontaneous remission. You could do a dose reduction. You could do drug holidays or time your intercourse with the dosing of your medication, similar to what they propose in some breastfeeding. Um, you could switch antidepressant agents, or you could use an adjunctive antidote. Um, or you could choose something initially, an antidepressant that is um, known to have a lower propensity for sexual dysfunction. But we don't have um, a lot of studies actually looking at any of these methods to say, well, this is better than that. Um, we have some evidence for phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors in erectile dysfunction. And we have some evidence for high-dose bupropion with serotonergic meds. But other than that, um, there's no real data. Um, busferone has conflicting data. Um, they say that low-dose is ineffective and high-dose is effective. So use high-dose if you're going to use it. Um, and then there are some case reports about alleviating sexual dysfunction with a whole slew of meds. So I'll just read through those quickly. And then um, amantadine, bethenicol, bromocryptine, ciproheptadine, psychostimulants, loratadine, neostigmine, trazodone, and yohembine. But no, no solid studies, nothing actually looking at this. So they conclude that treatment emergent sexual dysfunction is common in serotonergic agents, and it's uncommon with adrenergic and dopaminergic activity. And then my summary and take-home points from this are that um, sexual dysfunction in the setting of depressive disorder is... Um, and, and antidepressant treatment is complex. It's likely multifactorial. It's difficult to distinguish whether it's a symptom of the disease or a side effect of our treatment. Um, existing research on this topic is limited and relatively poor. 
quality. Um, it's a problem for most of the antidepressants we use. The serotonergic medications seem to be the worst. 5-HT2 antagonists are a little bit better, and the dopaminergic medications might be the best. Um, management strategies are not well-defined, but most commonly include switching agents, a dose reduction of the serotonergic medication, an adjunctive use of a dopaminergic medication, or in men, um, the use of phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors. And that's it. And I'm happy to try to answer any questions that I can. Yeah, thank you for that uh, summary. That was um, a long article that I think reviewed a lot of other studies. So thanks mm -hmm. for that. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to um, post them right now. We'll give it a moment. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're always welcome to add them on later. We'll always try to get back to you. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to get back to anybody. Yeah, I you don't know how many patients I've had tell me that they have sexual dysfunction with bupropion even though it's you yes know, so, me too yeah so I'm always like it's not supposed to <laughs> I know. but there it is so um I think all the medications really mm -hmm. uh unfortunately are um associated so all right well guys thank you and uh for watching thank you for listening thank you Dr. Dankovich for presenting um and thank uh, you for your patience with the technical difficulties everyone I'm very sorry <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's not you. I think sometimes um, also the um, platform is a little bit uh, mm -hmm. tricky. So who knows what it was. Mm -hmm. um, all right, guys, have a good night. And thanks again. Dr. Thank Dinkins. you very much. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Oh, oh, there might be one question slash comment. <laughs> Um, well, maybe a comment. Many years ago during residency, we would prescribe Yohimbine. Is that drug even still available? I have never Um, I have never pres prescribed it myself either. Um, my understanding, can you guys hear me? I think my, oh my God. There we go. Yeah, texting. Oh, hello? I, I'm back. Um, oh, yeah, I've, there you go. I've never prescribed it either. Um, yeah. I, my, my understanding is that it can inter it have a lot of potential negative interactions with other medications. So I've kind of steered away from it, but yeah. um, I'd be interested, was it helpful when you did prescribe it? Um, did, did patients report a lot of improvement with yeah. that? Um, <laughs> all the members said is, and I'm not going to call them out by name. I know. They're old. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be interesting to know. I, I'm going to look into that a little bit because I'll be mm -hmm. curious to know. I as well. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know more about it. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.